across the Game of Thrones fandom after episode 2, some fans have been wondering why so many of their friends lost their minds over that song Podrick sang last night, titled Jenny's Song. It was a very pretty song, and had a heartwarming montage behind it, but it's been many good songs throughout the show's life. Why did this one strike such a chord? Luckily for you though, I was one of those fans losing their mind over hearing Jenny's song, and in this video, I'm going to explain why. Who is this Jenny? What does that song mean? Where did it come from? And why is it so important to Game of Thrones? Jenny's Song is a folk song in Westeros, one of those songs that everybody knows the words to. In these times before Spotify and even records, musical entertainment came in the form of these folk songs that were, that were sung at campfires and around hearths. In the North, they all know songs like The Rat Cook or Brave Danny Flint or The Night That Ended. In the South, they have songs like The Bear and the Maiden Fair, Six Maids in a Pool, The Grim Reigns of Castamere, Seasons of My Love, and of course, Jenny's Song. These songs also served important roles in their society, often containing history, values, and legends that people can look up to and learn about, since many people in these times were illiterate. Jenny's song, though, is in particular about the enigmatic and tragic figure known as Jenny of Old Stones, the wife of Prince Duncan Targaryen. Jenny's song in the books is much shorter, we only really have a few lines that Martin has left unfinished. For the show version, though, we heard on Sunday, David Benioff and Dan Weiss added a few more lyrics. Most of the history of the characters I'm about to talk about really haven't been covered in the show, so strap yourselves in for a bit of a lore dump. It all starts with King Aegon V, known as Egg to his older brother Maester Aemon, came to the Iron Throne in 233 AC under some unusual circumstances giving him the nickname The Unlikely. One of the first things he needed to do after the destruction of the Blackfire Rebellions was he needed to solidify the realm. One of the primary alliances he wanted to rebuild was with Lord Lionel Baratheon of Storm's End. So when Egg had his first child with his wife Betha Blackwood, he made a marriage pact. His firstborn was Prince Duncan, named for Egg's best friend and Lord Commander of the Kingsguard, Duncan the Tall. Duncan and Egg are the main characters of the Knight of the Seven Kingdoms short story series Martin has produced. Prince Duncan was often named Duncan the Small, though. Egg promised this prince to Lord Lionel's daughter in order to secure the alliance that Egg wanted. However, in a way that will probably sound pretty familiar, <laughs> uh, Prince Duncan wasn't particularly in love with his future wife. It was a political marriage, not one he made of his own free will. So one day while Duncan was traveling through the Riverlands, he came across someone that instead made his heart soar like a dragon, Jenny of Oldstones. No one's really quite sure where Jenny came from, but the best guess is the Oldstones epithet that she has acquired over time. Oldstones is a ancient rune fortress in the Riverlands off the Blue Fork of the River Trident. The castle is apparently so old that no one even remembers its name, its history, or who built it, just calling it Oldstones. The last family to own the castle were the former kings of the River and first men, House Mud, who were wiped out sometime before Aegon's conquest by House Durandon. Since then, the castle has fallen into ruin, and as I mentioned, the name of the building was lost to time. The lines from the song is in reference to Old Stones the Castle. House Mud ruled for a thousand years from Old Stones before their destruction, kind of similar to the relationship the Starks had with Winterfell. Well, hopefully not that similar as the Night King looms over Winterfell. Jenny has well claimed descent from these same old First Men Kings of the Rivers. After a torrid romance between Duncan and Jenny, one reminiscent of Rhaegar and Lyanna and Robb Stark and Talissa, and even recently Jon Snow and Daenerys, Prince Duncan married his Jenny in a small ceremony without the permission of his father. Duncan just showed up at court with his new bride, and the weight of reality came crashing down around the newlyweds. Lord Baratheon was furious, as was King Aegon and his advisors. There's even talks that Lord Lionel might raise the army of the Stormlands in rebellion for the insult done to his daughters and himself. Every member of court, from the Grand Maester to High Sept to the Small Council to King Aegon himself, tried everything to get Duncan to give up his Jenny. The context of all this is, of course, the Blackfyre Rebellions, the Targaryen Civil War in which Daemon Blackfyre and his heirs tried to overthrow their cousin's house Targaryen and ravaged all of Westeros for decades. The realm had been destroyed and rebuilt over and over and over, in battle and sickness, no one wanted a return to war. Well, except for Lord Lionel. Lord Lionel was a man who loved battle. He had even volunteered for Duncan the Tall's Trial by Seven in the book The Hedge Knight to everyone's surprise. He laughed. There has not been a trial of seven for more than a hundred years. Do you know that? 
I was not about to miss a chance to fight the Kingsguard Knights and tweak Prince Makar's nose in the bargain. As a solution to Lord Lionel's rage, Prince Duncan instead abdicated the line of succession and being the Prince of Dragonstone rather than give up his love, seeing that as maybe the best option for soothing these tensions. Unfortunately, much like Rhaegar and Lyanna, the wheels were already in motion for an angry Baratheon coming straight at the Targaryens, and Lord Lionel crowned himself Storm King of Old and brought war on House Targaryen. The war eventually ended with a duel between Lord Lionel and the very same Duncan the Tall, but but through it all, Prince Duncan and Jenny managed to stay together. Jenny of Oldstones was an oddity in the court of the Targaryens. Not only was her favorite haunt a decaying ruin that she supposedly danced with ghosts in, but her best friend, she claimed, was a child of the forest. Jenny brought this very short woman to court, and it said that she's the one that claimed the prince that was promised would come from Prince Ares and Princess Rhaella. Over time, though, they became accepted, and Jenny became known as Lady Jenny, and Prince Duncan became the Prince of Dragonflies. The nature of their romance and the standing up against the forces tearing them apart made them not only popular figures in Westeros, but in songs. Jenny's song is one of many that was composed about their famous romance. But it's not a happy song. Jenny's song is a song of deep tragedy and sadness. As Sir Barristan said, the Prince of Dragonflies loved Jenny of Oldstone so much he cast aside a crown, and Westeros paid the price in corpses. The Baratheon Rebellion was short in length, but not short on death and intense violence. Without the dragons of Old Valyria, Aegon's forces had to beat back the Baratheons on the ground in brutal battles. This is something King Aegon never forgot, and at Summerhall he tried hatching dragons so that he could bring peace to Westeros under the threat of dragon fire. Instead, most of House Targaryen died in those flames that engulfed the building, including Egg himself, Duncan the Tall, and and the Prince of Dragonflies, Duncan. What's not noted though after the tragedy at Summerhall is what happened to Jenny of Oldstones. Most assume she died in the flames alongside her love as well, but no one quite knows it's not recorded her fate. The lyrics of Jenny's song and the sad remembrance are evocative of the idea that, that she maybe survived the flames, and the ghosts she danced with aren't just the long dead kings of the first men, but those she loved most, like her Prince Duncan. High in the halls of the kings who are gone, Jenny would dance with her ghosts. The ones she had lost and the ones she had found, and the ones who loved her the most. Jenny's song comes up again and again in the books as well. Catelyn Tully and Peter Baelish once played at being Duncan and Jenny while camping at the very same Old Stones. And most curiously, its performance is used as payment for an enigmatic figure known as the Ghost of High Heart in exchange for her prophetic dreams. And so Lem woke Tom Sevenstrings beneath his furs and brought him yawning to the fireside with his wood harp in hand. The same song as before, he asked. Oh aye, my Jenny song. Is there another? And so he sang, and the dwarf woman closed her eyes and rocked slowly back and forth, murmuring the words and crying. Thoros took Arya firmly by the hand and drew her aside. Let her savor her song in peace, he said. It is all that she has left. Many in the fandom believe that this old hunched dwarfish woman is actually the same woods witch that Jenny brought to court with her. The choice of always wanting to hear Jenny's song played from a member of the Brotherhood Without Banners known as Tom 07 on his harp, and that she later says she gorged on grief at Summerhall is certainly curious. She may in fact be a child of the forest. And this is a very important part of the lyrics and tone of Jenny's song, as we heard on Sunday. It's not a happy or a beat song, it's a song of deep pain and loss. The ones who'd been gone for so very long, she couldn't remember their names. They spun her around on the damp old stone, spun away all her sorrow and pain. 
It's the idea that although Jenny and Duncan loved each other, the cost of their love was enormous. The body count of Lord Baratheon's rebellion, the losses of so many of the Targaryens at Summerhall, the pressures their relationship put on Aegon that made him seek out dragons again, the very prophecy that forced the Mad King Aerys to marry his unwilling sister Rhaella, and all that followed to the current day. So much goes back to Duncan and his Jenny. These themes and ideas are carried through as well to Prince Rhaegar and his lady Lyanna. The parallels between their stories are striking, although the more capable King Aegon was able to end the angry Baratheon before he overthrew the crown, unlike his mad grandson Aerys. Still, the ideas of choosing the one you love no matter the consequences echoes throughout Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire. There's a wonderful theory by a brilliant member of the community named Cantus that I should mention as well. Cantus is one of the brightest minds in the fandom, and if you haven't read his work, you are really missing out. In his essay titled Broken Bonds, The Secret of Rhaegar's Song, he proposes that it was actually Jenny's song that Rhaegar played at the tourney of Harrenhal and made Lyanna Stark fall in love with him. I won't go into the full theory here. You should really read Cantus's post on his WordPress for its brilliance, so there will be links in the description for that. But basically, Rhaegar played the harp just like Tom 07. He was known to frequent Summerhall and the Riverlands. And he had a love of playing sad, bittersweet songs just like Jenny's song. And we have this description of Lyanna's reaction to actually hearing Rhaegar playing that night in Harrenhal. The dragon prince sang a song so sad it made the wolf maid sniffle. But when her pup brother teased her for crying, she poured wine over his head. And also how others describe the kind of songs Rhaegar normally played on his harp. When you heard him play his high harp with the silver strings, and sing of twilights and tears and the death of kings, you could not but feel that he was singing of himself and those he loved. And even Cersei Lannister, this is how she felt listening to his music. By night the prince played his silver harp and made her weep. When she had been presented to him, Cersei had almost drowned in the depths of his sad purple eyes. So in a way, Jenny's song is Lyanna's song and Cersei's song and Sansa's, and Arya's, and Brienne's, and Daenerys's. All those faces who flashed on screen as Podrick crooned out the words to Jenny's song. It's a song about those they have found and lost. The ghosts they carry with them everywhere. The scars of their past. The ghosts they dance and spin with in those old stones. How reaching out to others in friendship and love can be painful and may very well end in tragedy and pain. But still, they dance on those damp old stones and memories never wanting to leave. And perhaps most intriguingly, we hear of only one song that Rhaegar mentions, and it's actually from the book version of The House of the Undying, when Daenerys unexpectedly sees her older brother and his first wife Elia and their firstborn son. Will you make a song for him? The woman asked. He has a song, the man replied. He is the prince that was promised, and his is the song of ice and fire. He looked up when he said it, and his eyes met Danny's, and it seemed as if he saw her standing there beyond the door. There must be one more, he said, though whether he was speaking to her or the woman in the bed, she could not say. The dragon has three heads. He went to the window seat, picked up a harp, and ran his fingers lightly over its silvery strings. Sweet sadness filled the room as man and wife and babe faded like the morning mist, only the music lingering behind to speed her on her way. Jenny's song may be John's song as well, the song of ice and fire, the sweet sadness of his life and doom romances and the losses he's felt, the death of Eager in his arms, the old stones of Castle Black and Winterfell in the crypts, the sorrow and pain he's felt and carries around him like ghosts, the crumbling walls around him, and the coming of winter. Rhaegar's Jenny is down there with John in the crypts, his lady Lyanna, maybe still crying at Jenny's song, and for her son she will never know. But the song isn't over just yet. John and Danny find themselves in the exact same scenario as Rhaegar and Lyanna and Duncan and Jenny before them. John has told Danny that he is Aegon Targaryen, and Danny instantly realizes what that means about his claim versus hers for the Iron Throne. How will they go forwards? Will their love for each other survive the political turmoil and the coming battle? Will John be like Damon Blackfire and Aegon the Second of the Past and push his claim like Sam urged him? 
Or will they be like Duncan the Prince of Dragonflies and abdicate their claims for love? Would they choose love or power, the heart in conflict with itself? We will find out in the coming weeks if these two will remember Jenny of Oldstones and her song, or if they will remember fire and blood.